Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Maysville. If you're visiting with us, we're truly grateful for your presence this morning. And uh, we hope that you could be back with us again this afternoon for our evening worship at 5 o'clock. If you are visiting with us, please fill out a visitor's card, the blue card on the back of the pew in front of you, and pass it towards the center aisle, and we can have a record of your attendance. This morning we'll be led an opening prayer by Brother Pat Bradford, our closing prayer by Brother Greg Richards. If you take a songbook, please, and turn to number 788, number 788. Just a few moments, Carrie Rosenblum will lead us in that opening song. Several announcements in our bulletin to cover this morning. We're saddened uh, again to mention the passing of uh, Sister Dolores Doherty, and her uh, funeral was yesterday. Uh, and um, we want to extend our sympathy to that entire family. Um, remember the preteen group you'll be meeting tonight for a devotional and an activity after services. Bring some money uh, to, for an outing to, ice, to get ice cream at Brewster's. Uh, there will be a bridal tea for Rachel Etheridge and Daniel Harbin next Sunday, July the 17th. That's from 2 to 4 here at the building in the fellowship hall. Pre please bring your gifts early that they may be displayed during the tea. Um, the prime timers, you're having an activity also, a fellowship cover dish uh, on Tuesday night. That's at 6 p.m. in the fellowship hall. We encourage that uh, all the members of this age group to, to be a part of that and enjoy the good fellowship and the good food. Ushers, if you'll pick up the visitor's cards, please. Elders and deacons, you have a meeting this afternoon at 4 o'clock. Um, the Thursday night Bible study this week will be at the Bradfords. Uh, they'll eat at 6, and the study will begin at 6.30. If you come to that activity, please bring a drink, chips, or dessert for that. I want to congratulate Emily and Robert Hatfield uh, in their wedding that was Friday night. And uh, in the bulletin, you'll find their new address if you want to be able to write to, to them. It would be a good idea. The men's breakfast, remember that, is Saturday the 23rd, beginning at 8. You don't have to bring anything, but we do ask that you sign the sheet uh, of attendance back there so they'll get a head count and know how much to, food to prepare. Remember, Puppet Team 2, you'll be uh, part participating in the worship tonight. Start with the opening prayer this, with Brother Pat. Let us pray. Father, we come to you today thanking you for all the blessings that you give us. The blessings in being able to gather together today to worship you, to be with one another, to raise our voices in song and prayer, to encourage one another, to learn from each other how to better serve you and those around us. Father, we thank you for the blessings of new families. Thank you for the wedding that happened this weekend, for this new family that's been established. Help us, being their brothers and sisters in Christ, to encourage them in their new life together. Bless the new families that have been blessed with children. Again, Father, help us to help them to show these new children you in everything we do and everything we say. Father, we ask you to bless those of our group who mourn. Comfort them, Father, with your blessings. And again, Father, help us to be a comfort to them, that we may show your love for us by our love to them. And Father, we ask that you bless us now. Bless us in this time together. Bless us that we might be lifted up as we lift praises to you, that we might worship in a way that you find pleasing and acceptable. Now, Father, we ask that you keep us in your care always. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life, words of life and beauty. Teach me faith and duty, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful 
wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ the blessed one gives to all wonderful words of life. Sinner, listen to the loving call, wonderful words of life. All oh, so freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer oh, pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever, beautiful words, wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Very good. 937, 937. This song we dedicate to Jesus this morning as we consider the life, his cruel death on the cross, and his triumphant victory in sitting at the God's right hand today. We're about to partake of his memorial feast, and before that we're going to sing this song. Sometimes, you know, in our arenas today in different ways, we give people a standing ovation, you know, because of their work and everything and one time before we did this but when we get down in the song where it says that I stand I stand in all of you if you're in a position to do so I'd like for you to stand up for the rest of the song and then be seated before we partake of his supper as we honor Jesus this morning <clears throat> 937 you are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard, I can grasp your infinite wisdom Who can fathom The depths of your love You are beautiful beyond description Majesty enthroned above And I stand Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful for this opportunity to come together as a family around this table. Father, we understand that the sacrifice of Jesus is what made it possible for us to be a family here. Father, this bread represents his body upon the cross. May we take it in a manner well-pleasing in your sight. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for Jesus' life. We're thankful for the example he gave us, for the teachings he gave to us. Father, we're thankful for his death, for the blood that he shed on the cross that gives us forg for forgiveness of our sins. Father, we're thankful for this cup that represents that blood. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Number 643, 643, and we're about to have opportunity to give back of what we possess to God is a sacrifice, if we will, of some of what we have back to him. Sometimes we kind of think it's, uh, you know, he gives to us, we give back to him. We have those birthday gifts that come along, and somebody gives us a $25 gift certificate somewhere, and, you know, when it comes to their birthday, we kind of give them back $25 gift certificate somewhere we think we kind of got it on the even keel it's not that way with the lord he's got us outmatched on giving many many times so what we need to do is think about how little we have to offer him and how much we can give him in appreciation for what so much he does for us 643 <clears throat> the lord my shepherd is i shall be well supplied since he is mine and I am his what can I want beside what can I want beside he leads me to the place where heavenly pasture grows where living waters gently pass and full salvation flows and full salvation flows if ever i go astray he does my soul reclaim and guides me Let us pray. Dear God and Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day you've given us and each and every blessed in life. This time, Lord, as we come to give a portion back to you of all the many things you've blessed us with that we'll give in a way that's pleasing in your sight, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please mark number 107, number 107, we'll sing that after our lesson. <clears throat> now number 756, 756.
you'd like to, please stand. We'll sing this together. 756. <clears throat> sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day. Rejoicing that will be when we all say Jesus will sing and shout the victory while we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will over spread the sky, but when traveling day. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all say Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Shout the victory. Be seated, please. <clears throat> good morning. It is good to see you this morning. Good to have you with us. We're thankful for your presence. Those of you who may be visiting with us, we're glad you've come our way. And we're glad to be able to gather with our brothers and sisters here at Maysville and share in the time that we have together. I'm just up here this morning to introduce our speaker. I don't know what he's preaching on this morning, but Lonnie's here, ready to go. Brother, stand up. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, stand up. If he shows up with a suit and tie on, he's got to be preaching. So <clears throat> I met him in the foyer, and I said, well, what are you speaking on? He said, I'm not speaking on nothing. That's the kind of sermon they want to hear, brother. Come on up here. Several years ago, there was a, uh, okay, it's been a lot of years ago, there was a little show on TV, I think it was called To Tell the Truth, where they would have uh, one contestant who had some background that the, uh, or one person on there who had some interesting background, the contestants, three contestants, or four, or whatever, would try to guess who was the real person, and so they would ask questions about it. I thought about getting Lonnie up here, one on one side and one on the other, and kind of fake you out which one was going to preach. Okay, enough trouble at my friend and brother's expense. Good to see you, tie or not. I hope you have your Bibles. We're going to use them right at the beginning. I'm going to give you a minute to find the book of Jonah. Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Work your way back. One of the minor prophets. Book of Jonah. It only covers about a, two pages in my Bible. I want to read it. Then we'll make a few observations about our text. Book of Jonah, chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare and went down into it 
to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had lain down, and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Please tell us, For whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country? Of what people are you? So he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up, throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the fish's belly, and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The waters surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought me, brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out onto dry land. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, nor herd nor flock taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell? if God will turn and relent and turn away from His fierce anger, so that we may not perish. Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that He had said He would bring upon them, and He did not do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life for me, 
for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat down on the east side of the city, and there he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up and cover Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned, the next day, God prepared a worm, and so it damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose, and God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, it is right for me to be angry even to death. But the Lord said, You have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock? Paul said in the book of Romans, the things that were written before were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scripture might have hope. What do we learn from Jonah? Oh, I know we've talked about Jonah a number of times. Our, our children love to sing the little song. Who did? Who swallowed Jonah? The whale did. Why did that whale swallow Jonah? Let me make several observations, and there are, there are way more lessons in the book of Jonah than we can possibly cover in the morning, but let me pick some morsels. Number one, the Word of God came to Jonah. We don't live in a time where God speaks to us the way that God spoke at one time to the people. Hebrews chapter 1, beginning in the first verse, says in the olden days and times past, God spoke to the fathers through the prophets by means of visions, by dreams, in a number of different ways. Then in verse 2, but now speaks to us through Jesus his son. Of course, Jesus does not speak directly to us either. Jesus spoke to his apostles. His apostles wrote down the things that Jesus said, that Jesus taught. The Holy Spirit that Jesus promised to them, John chapter 14, Jesus said, I'm going to give you this Spirit. This Spirit will remind you of the things I've said, teach you of the things you need to pass along. You will give these to all nations. And so we have the Scriptures written for us, the words of God, the message from God, written. Jonah had the Word of God spoken to him directly. We have the words of God that are confirmed to us by those who wrote them. The Word can come to us in the same way. Our knowledge of the Scriptures, of what's right and wrong, what's proper and improper, is no different. No different in concept, no different in content than when God spoke directly to, Moses, uh, directly to Noah, to Jonah. Um, as he was uh, being ordered to go to Nineveh. The Word of God came. Number two, Jonah didn't want to obey. There's a lot of material that we could use in, in supporting this position, but it's not necessary to do a great deal to talk about Assyria. We know the concept here. Jonah with his own mouth gives all the testimony that's required. He doesn't want to go. Why doesn't he want to go? Well, we don't find out in chapter 1 why he doesn't want to go. We just find out that he doesn't go. We don't find out why in chapter 2. We don't really find out why in chapter 3. We find out why in chapter 4. And the why in chapter 4 is Jonah hates these people. He hates Assyria. He doesn't want anything to do with them. 
They're an evil, wicked people as far as Jonah is concerned, and he wants them wiped off the face of the earth. He doesn't want God's message of mercy and salvation proclaimed to them so that they might be spared. He wants them dead. Or at least, if not dead, he doesn't want them under God's care. He wants them excluded from any hope of, of mercy from the, the hand of God. He would love for God's vengeance to be poured out upon them. And that's what he says. He said, that's why I didn't want to come preach to these folks. After he does his fish encounter and he uh, later finally goes to the city and he sees that God spares the town because Jonah's gone through and preached. They've all repented in sackcloth and ashes. And he sees they've all repented. And he says, now that's just great. God's not going to destroy the city. That's why I didn't do it in the first place. And so he goes and plants himself out on the, the uh, hill outside of town to watch the city to be disgruntled. And now he's griping at God. You see, that's why I didn't want to come preach. I knew you weren't going to bring your wrath on them. He, did, he didn't want to. In all fairness, Assyria was not a great country in terms of, if you looked at them from their neighbor's point of view, they were fierce warriors. They had committed what probably many of us would consider, if we were looking back from a historical perspective, atrocities. It was known for them to go into cities and for them to take especially the leading males of any town that was conquered and impale them on spikes on the city walls. That was one of their, their favorites. It was described as being hung on the tree. It is the phrase from which eventually will come the idea of crucifixion, but literally in the Old Testament to be hung on the tree means to, impale, to be impaled upon a spike of wood. And they would strip their skulls, they would take their bodies and, and after removing various parts from them, they would carry their trophies around their, their necks and their heads. The Assyrians in their own stelas and in their own uh, walls that depict with the pictures on them of the conquerors of the Assyrians so show graphic drawings and etchings of the Assyrians with captives slaughtered in various ways with body parts hung around their necks. Apparently they loved skulls. They would take the skulls and they would hang them around their necks. At some of the cities they would take a, a, a pole um, a tall, maybe like a spear type device, and on it they would make a column of skulls. And so you would have this pole sticking out of the ground, and they would take these bleached skulls, and they would stack them one on top of another so that it made a column of human skulls. Testimony to their viciousness. Don't mess with us. Would you want to go preach to them? And he said, sure, Jonah was, was nuts. If God wanted them preached to, he should have gone and done it. It's hard for us really to, pre to uh, prepare our minds to always make good equivalents. Let's take up a contribution and send missionaries to Iran. How many of you want to contribute? Let's send missionaries to Pakistan, Saudi Arabia. Let's send missionaries to the Gaza Strip. We want to go missionary or to preach to the people of Hamas. You interested? Back during World War II, when Germans and not, uh, Japanese were, I think you could probably use the term hated by Americans, or at least by many Americans, it would have been met with outrage to imagine that we would send missionaries to Japan to preach to them the gospel of Jesus Christ, or to Germans, to Nazi Germany. Libby and I, after we were married, were test driving a car in uh, Jackson, Tennessee. 
And uh, this would have been, what, about uh, 1978 or something like that? i got to figure out where my wife is. She's not in her place. 78, 79. I mean, we had just barely been married. We're test driving a car, and, and uh, it, it really wasn't made that well. It was an American-made vehicle and wasn't so good. And I commented to the guy that I was going to go down the street a little bit and drive a, a Toyota and he launched into this tirade from the back seat. You got to be kidding me. You're going to go over there and drive one of those Jap cars? Well, one of those guys that made that car may have killed your granddaddy in the war. <laughs> I, was, I was shocked. He was, this was not a show. This guy was violently in opposition to Japanese cars being sold in this country, and he was incensed that I would even think about going to drive one. Are there any people around you that you would just absolutely be unwilling to communicate the gospel to? Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Who did that include? There are some interesting stories that we have in the New Testament. One of them is where the, the most graphic description between the, the two conversants is in Acts chapter 9 when the Lord speaks to Ananias and says, Go into the city and speak to a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus. And the, the conversation that occurs is, is mildly comical to us. We look at it and Ananias says, Lord, do you know who this guy is? He's, he's up here persecuting Christians. And the Lord says, Yes, I know who he is. And he's going to be a, a big help to me. <laughs> but Lord, you can't really mean you want me to go and preach to this guy. You know, he could put me in prison. I could, he's up here killing folks like me. I want Saul to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Ananias not only would not have picked Saul of Tarsus, none of the church would have picked Saul of Tarsus, even though they had the message, go and preach the gospel to every creature. They weren't going to preach to Saul of Tarsus. After Saul is converted, he's now a Christian. He goes to the Christians in Damascus. They won't have anything to do with him. He goes down to Jerusalem. They don't want anything to do with him. There's a man by the name of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. He's a Roman. He's a centurion. They wouldn't have preached to him. In fact, after Peter was summoned by God through Cornelius to go and preach, Peter still didn't want to go and preach to him. And after he did go and preach to him, he said, okay, but I'm going to get in trouble for this. And he did. And then he has to defend himself in Acts chapter 11 when all the church hears about it, that he went in and preached to this Gentile, and they want to know what on earth were you thinking? Have you lost your mind? Why did you go preach to this guy? And Peter says, look. Here I was, I'm minding my own business in this, in this guy's house, I'm in Simon the Tanner's house, and I see this vision, and this vision tells me what God has made clean, don't call unclean. And while I'm trying to figure out what that means, this guy's knock on the door, and they tell me to go with them to see this guy that God has spoken to, and God says, go with them. What are you fussing at me for? The Lord's the one that told me to go preach to this guy. They didn't want anything to do with them. We here in our protected place in the United States of America might think that we are anxious to go and preach the gospel to every creature. That's what the Bible says. Let's go do it. In real life, there are lots of communities where people don't even want to preach the gospel to the people living next door. They don't want to talk, preach the gospel over here. Wow. Do you know what kind of people live over there? I mean, really. I'm not going to give you a lot of the background details regarding it, but uh, a man once took a job preaching in a rural county. He moved in. He'd been working with them for just a couple of weeks, and he met one of the local guys in the community who happened to be an individual of an ethnicity different than most of the people at the local church. That's just how I'm going to phrase it. 
And uh, the local congregation wasn't too thrilled about the fact that uh, these particular visitors were there, but they didn't say anything about it the first day. Next week, there were some more of those persons visiting there, and the congregation then confronted the new preacher and said, uh, what are you doing? He said, I'm, I'm preaching the gospel. I'm inviting these people to come to church. And they said, we don't, we don't really want them coming to church here. He said, what do you mean you don't want them to come to church here? Now, that they're, they're not our kind of folk. We don't want them coming to church here. He pondered that for a little bit and said, uh, well, if you don't want them coming to church here, then, then you've got a problem because the gospel of Jesus is supposed to go out to all men everywhere. And they said, we don't want them coming to church here. He said, well, if that's the way you feel about it, then I wish I hadn't come. And they said, if that's the way you feel about it, we wish you hadn't come either, and we can solve it. Leave. That's a true story. Who do we think are good candidates for the gospel of Jesus Christ? God said everyone. And interestingly enough, the folks that we might think are most susceptible may not be the ones that want to hear the gospel. And the ones who may need to hear it most perhaps are the ones that we are most uninclined to go and preach to. But we press on. Jonah chose to run away. He didn't want to obey, and he made a choice. He chose to run away. He clearly understood it was he got on the boat, there were a couple of choices. One, he could go over to Nineveh, where he was supposed to be. Or number two, he was going to Tarshish. Now, you look on a, on a map and find Tarshish. It's all the way over in the lower part of Spain. Okay, so Nineveh is one way. I'm not sure you could get to it by boat. Actually, I know better. You can't get to it by boat. He needed to make a, a cross-country land journey. But no, he doesn't want to go that way. He goes, gets on a boat and heads the other direction just as far as he can go. He is running the wrong way as hard as he can. James said in James chapter 4, verse 17, to him who knows to do good and does it not, it is sin. I don't know that we're really any better than Jonah in, in a lot of ways. There are times that we find out what's right and we, we refuse to obey. We don't, we don't want to do it. And then not only do we not want to have the information or not want to do it, we may actually go the other way and, and walk off. There's a story I'm not going to take the time to read. Luke chapter 12. Jesus talks about who is the uh, faithful servant who's going to be honored when the Lord comes again. He's the one who the Lord will find doing what he should. But the one, he goes on, the one who knows the Lord's bidding but doesn't do it when the Lord comes again will be beaten with many stripes. The fourth observation we'll make about Jonah is how comfortable he was with his decision. This wasn't something he fretted over. His conscience wasn't bothered by it a bit. Jonah gets on the ship. He checks in, goes down and finds him a nice little spot. And what does he do? Goes to sleep. Now, you know what it's like when things are bothering you, when something's eating on your, on your heart, when you know you've done wrong, when you know you haven't done the things you should, and your conscience keeps you up at night, and it just won't let you sleep. Not Jonah. <laughs> Sleeps like a baby. Storm comes up. Winds are blowing. Jonah's fine and dandy. There's a story that Jesus told about a man who had two sons. He says, the man told his two sons to go work in the vineyard. The first son said, I will not go. But afterward, it says he repented and went. The story recorded in Matthew chapter 21, start reading about verse 28. Doesn't really give us a lot of the details that are back there, but it infers that the boy, as he thought about it, 
his conscience began to work on him. You know, my dad told me to go do this, and I, I, I smarted off. I said I wouldn't go. And, okay, I, yeah, I need to go. His conscience causes him to change his mind. The other boy says, yeah, I'll go. But then he doesn't. As long as our conscience is still bothering us, if you can't sleep at night because you feel like there's things that you've done wrong in your life, I'm happy for you. No, seriously, I'm happy for you. Because that means your conscience is still working. And if your conscience is still working, if it's, if it's prodding you and jabbing you and it's not letting you be at peace, you know you're doing what's wrong and you're violating the will of God and, and you just don't have comfort and peace in your life because you know it, good for you. Good for you that your conscience is still working. Good for you that you're not at peace. Because as long as you're not at peace, there's some hope of your repentance. But when you come to peace with sin, when you have gotten to a place where it doesn't bother you, when you can be involved in what is wrong and you can be rebellious against God and you sleep like a baby, you're in trouble then. Number five. You can't run from God. You can try, but you can't run from God. We can make three quick subheadings to this. You can't escape God's presence. Psalm 139, beginning in verse 7, David talks about, Where would I go from your presence? Where would I flee from your, from your spirit? If I go to the mountains, you're there. If I go out of the desert, you're there. If I should... Go out into the middle of the ocean. There you are. He talks about your right hand should hold me. You would embrace me. There was no place you could go to get away from God. Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 24. Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth? There's no place you can go to get away from God. There's sometimes people go to secret places. I, teenagers, you think you got a secret place in your room your parents don't know about? Sorry to make you feel a little awkward at this moment. Chances are they could find it if they wanted to. There's no place you can go and hide. Secondly, you can't escape God's authority. Well, it doesn't apply to me. Yes, it does. Acts chapter 17, verse 30, as Paul is preaching to the Athenians, he says, God raised up Jesus from the dead, proof that he is going to judge the world. And he says, he now commands all men everywhere to repent. When Jesus gave the Great Commission recorded for us in Mark chapter 16, he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's for everyone. None of us escapes the authority of God. And thirdly, we won't escape God's judgment. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus describing the judgment scene beginning in verse 31 says, When the Lord shall be there at the right hand of God and all nations shall be gathered together. They'll all be there. Number six, repentance means coming back to God. I know you know this, but I think I need to say it. You can change. I can change. They can change. They can change. Whoever we're talking about, they can change. Repentance is one of the qualities that human beings have within us. It is possible for us to come to understand something in a different way and to decide to do differently. You have the capacity, regardless of how you have lived your life in the past, you have the capacity to become a child of God. You have the ability to denounce the things that may have brought you pleasure, the things that you may have given yourself over to, and to become one of God's children. The proof of that is in the book of Jonah. Here is this evil, wicked, terrible city. God sends one preacher to them, and they all repent in sackcloth and ashes. 
Saul of Tarsus knew the facts of Jesus, I suspect, before he had the preaching of, of Ananias given to him. I don't know that for a fact, but I find it just almost impossible to believe that Saul, up to date as he is on the training that the Hebrew uh, school would have brought to him, Jesus in such a prominent position, Paul then, or Saul then setting about to persecute the followers of Jesus, he knew about the stuff. He didn't believe it. All it took was one piece of information to change Saul's evaluation of Jesus. He found out that it was real. On the road to Damascus, God allowed a message to give, be given to Saul. And immediately, he became a preacher in the city of Damascus. Sometimes we know what we ought to do. Sometimes we know the things we should do. But for whatever reason, we don't do it. Word of the Lord came to Jonah the first time, and he ran away. Then after he had his fish encounter, chapter 3 begins in the same way, and it says the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Sometimes in life, we'll have experiences and things will happen to us, and then maybe we will have, after the storms of life, an opportunity to hear another time. Jonah still was not where he should be heart-wise after the second message, but he did change and do what God wanted him to do. You know the way home. If you're away from God, you know how to get back where you need to be. If you've been one of God's children, you've allowed things to pull you away, if the heart has been won over again by the things of the world. You know where home is and how to get there. But it may be that you're not a Christian. That the world has had you in its grasp. That you have lived without the knowledge of Jesus Christ with God as your Savior. You have not heard the message that God loves you. That God wants to save you from your sins. And that because of that, God paid the price for your sins through the blood of His own Son, Jesus, the Son of Nazareth, or the, uh, uh, the Savior from Nazareth. Jesus, the Son of God. And by those nails put into His hands, and by those thorns driven into His brow, and by that spear into His side, the blood flowed. The blood for our forgiveness. Jesus described it his own self in Matthew as he gathered with his disciples before the night of his death. He said, this is the, my blood in a new covenant. The blood of Jesus Christ was shed for your sins. If you would have the blood of Christ applied to your life and forgiven, you need to repent, which means to change the way you are, to change the way you think, change the way you act, and be baptized for the remission of sins, baptized in water, immersed into what Paul describes in Romans chapter 6 as immersed into the death of Christ so that we may rise to walk a new life. And there's just one more word that I want to describe this morning, and that is forgiveness. It's hard really to understand forgiveness. If something is insignificant and you've been forgiven of it, that's, it's, you know, we just kind of brush it aside. But forgiveness means that a debt has been paid, a debt has been removed from us. We are not, we are not subject to it anymore. We are not responsible for it anymore. If someone forgave a debt to you of $10, you'd say, thanks, appreciate it. If someone gave, forgave you a debt of $100, what would you say? Oh, yeah, thank you. I really appreciate that. How about if they forgave you a debt of $1,000? Wow. Really? No kidding? I'm going to forgive you a debt of $10,000. No way. I'm going to forgive your debt of $100,000. You've got to be kidding me. I'm going to forgive your debt of a $1,000,000. There's no way. 
10 million, 100 million, a billion. Where would we get the number up until the point came where you just said, that cannot be possible. That's what forgiveness means. When Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he said, God has forgiven us of our sins. That's the, that's the message of Jesus Christ, forgiven. And he said, I'm the proof. I am God's testimony. I am God's poster child of forgiveness. He said, I am the chief of sinners. I was a blasphemer. I killed Christians. I put them in jail. And when the vote was given on what to do with them, I voted for them to be put to death. I did it. And God has forgiven me of that. How could you live with that? God has forgiven us. If you're a Christian, God has forgiven you of your past sins. Sometimes even as children of God, we live with sin in our lives and it, it, it robs us of our joy. And we look back and we reflect on the things of our lives in the past that were wrong. And we obsess over those. If you've asked God to forgive you of them and you've put them away, they're gone. They're gone. Don't give it another thought. You've been forgiven. But if they're still there, then they need to go away. And they do so in the blood of Christ. You can have that now. If you're not a Christian, confess before this audience that you believe in Jesus as the Son of God and be baptized for the remission of sins. And your sins can be forgiven today, now, while we stand and sing. Won't you come? This glen isn't believing in Jesus. There is light. Come unto me, O ye that labor and are heavy laden. Thank you, Tim. 632 will be our closing hymn.
632. Have our closing prayer after the first and the uh, uh, second stanzas of this, please. Hope you'll be back this evening to worship at 5 o'clock again. And again, if you're visiting with us, I'd like for you to come back then, or if we can do something else for you, you'll let us know. <clears throat> Of one the Lord has made the race, through one has come the fall. Where sin has gone, the sky is grace, the gospel is for all. The blessed gospel is for all, the gospel is for all. Where sin has gone, the sky is grace, the gospel is for all. Say not the heathen are at home, beyond we have no call. For why should we be blessed alone, the gospel is for all. The blessed gospel is for all, the gospel is for all. Where sin has gone, must go his grace, the gospel is for all. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we come to you now to thank you for the day that you have given us and the many blessings of it. Dear Lord, help us to remember that the gospel is for all and that we should go out and teach everyone that we see, regardless of what we think, that we should do your will. Dear Lord, again, thank you for this day and the many blessings of it. Thank you for this church and give us a chance to come back this evening. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.